This is an educational video on the endovascular treatment of a tentorial dural artery venous fistula. This is Omar Chowdhury, the fellow in neurointerventional at Stanford, with Michael Marks as the senior author. Um, this uh, treatment is on a 65-year-old female who presented to our service with headaches. Um, she is someone who uh, was known to our service uh, with a prior history of a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a pica aneurysm rupture, underwent clipping, made a good recovery, and then presented approximately a year later with worsening headaches and symptoms of imbalance at that time. Uh, we completed uh, MRI imaging for her, and what you see is an MRI of the brain axial sequences for a sequence called ASL, or arterial spin labeling, uh, where you can see bright signal near the galenic complex the torcula and the left transfer sigmoid sinus um, indicating arteriovenous shunting. Uh, based on these features, we recommended the patient to undergo a cerebral angiogram to characterize if there was any fistulization. Uh, this is a cerebral angiogram, a left vertebral artery injection, and you can see there's already some arteriovenous shunting near the vein of Galen, uh, the straight sinus, and subsequent early venous drainage into the right transfer sigmoid system. Um, similarly, a lateral projection angiographic run from the left vert where you can see the shunting from the uh, distal PC branches into the galenic complex and early venous drainage into the uh, straight sinus and the transfer sigmoid system, uh, indicating a dural artery venous fistula. These single images demonstrate the same fistula at the tentorial galenic complex from the distal PCA branches. These angiographic images show a left internal carotid artery injection where you can see additional supply to the dural arteriovenous fistula in the uh, area of the tentorium in Sasura, known as a galenic tentorial arteriovenous fistula. Uh, this lateral projection you can see the supply across the PCOM with the PCA branches and from the artery of Bernus Cani and Casanari or the tentorial artery with anterograde drainage into the straight sinus and the transfer sigmoid system. This would be characterized as a Conyard 2B tentorial galenic dural arteriovenous fistula based on this Conyard classification where type 2B is where you have drainage from the main sinus with reflux into cortical veins in this particular case into the cerebellar hemispheric vein which was pointed out in the prior angiographic image indicating a slightly increased risk of bleeding. So in summary this patient had a tentorial dural artery in his fistula with supply from the tentorial branch of left PCA, the artery of David Offen Schechter, the artery of Bernus Connie Casanari of the Meninga hypophyseal trunk from the left carotid and some uh, supply from the posterior choroidal artery branches. Um, again, the fistula pocket was near the vein of Galen uh, and subsequent drainage was into an enlarged vein of Galen uh, which then drained into the straight sinus uh, and the right transfer sigmoid system with some reflux into the cortical vein um, as mentioned before. Um, based uh, on these angiographic features, we decided to proceed with treatment, recommended treatment because the patient was having uh, features of uh, venous hypertension and headache and imbalance. Um, it was a standard room setup. We use general anesthesia for these cases. We use neurophysiologic monitoring with upper and lower extremity somatosensory evoke potentials. Motor evoke potentials, EEG, and bilateral auditory evoke potentials are important for monitoring brainstem function, especially in these posterior fossa fistulae. An arterial line is used for blood pressure monitoring. Heparin is used to target ACTs at 250. And we monitor for hemodynamic changes during DMSO and on next injections because DMSO uh, can cause uh, vasonecrosis and hemodynamic changes such as the trisaminal cardiac reflex. The patient is positioned supine, head neutral, is strapped. Uh, we uh, do the procedures in a bioplan and geography suite. We have uh, uh, a Siemens uh, Artis Z system in which we do our procedures uh, in a hybrid uh, uh, room. Uh, there's a transfemoral groin axis and we use a heparinized flush on all the lines that are used for the procedure, um, uh, which is a fairly uh, standard setup uh, for neurointerventional procedures uh, uh, done um, uh, at many other centers. 
few things regarding the access for these patients uh, um, for this particular case uh, this patient was 65 so it usually helps to have a good support system um, in terms of access we used a 645 she was, was sitting in the descending aorta through that we used a uh, um, a very flexible uh, guide catheter, a five French envoy, which was placed in the left vertebral artery with a flexible guide wire. We used a headway dual micro catheter for uh, selection of the uh, small intracranial vessels, a synchro 2 wire for the selection process, and Onyx 18 was the embolic agent used. Um, this is a, a picture from the operating room setup from this case where you can see it's a sterile table set up with a second table uh, on the side where we drop the embolic agent and usually change our gloves when we drop the embolic agent for the embolization. We have the anesthesia set up behind the uh, biplane monitors, AP views, these are working projections oblique, where you can see the microcatheter, which is a headway dual microcatheter, uh, is traveling from the PCAP1 segment to the artery of Davidoff and Schechter, all the way distally into the meningeal branch, feeding the fistula. And uh, this is a lateral uh, projection showing the same thing uh, where you can see filling of the fistula pocket and then draining into the straight sinus. And you can see the shunt valve uh, and the catheter from the previous VP shunt the patient has had placed in the past. Um, but again, important to realize that how the microcatheter has been navigated all the way to the fistula point. This is a microcatheter angiographic run which was completed uh, right before uh, the embolization. And you can see it's directly filling the fistula pocket, the vein of Galen, the straight sinus, and then the right transfer sigmoid system. And um, uh, every effort should be made to place the tip of the microcatheter as close as possible to the fistula pocket to allow its appropriate obliteration with the embolic agent. This is uh, a lateral angiographic one from the uh, microcatheter again, where you can see that uh, we're at the very distal end of that the left PCA meningeal branch. Once the microcatheter is in position, we proceed with embolization using Onyx 18. The microcatheter is flushed with saline, followed by priming the microcatheter with DMSO, which is the solvent equivalent to the dead space, which is 0.34 cc in terms of the microcatheter we used, and then we inject Onyx and roadmap views. This will be demonstrated on these angiographic runs where you can see these magnified AP working projections where the microcatheter is in place. And if you look at these images carefully, you will see uh, percolation of onyx material slowly into the fistula pocket um, as we inject it under roadmap views. Um, and after following uh, on the lateral projections as well, you can appreciate that uh, onyx allows obliteration of different pockets of the fistula site. An onyx cast is hence obtained, which conforms to the initial fistula pocket filling during the microcatheter injections we had demonstrated earlier. The embolization can be continued over half an hour to sometimes as much as an hour to allow the percolation of the correct fistula pocket. And you can see in these images that the onyx is now getting into the accessory pockets associated with the fistula. This start-stop technique is used to allow the onyx to polymerize and then to find new pockets. These post-treatment images demonstrate the onyx cast and an angiographic cure of the fistula on the left vertebral artery injection. A 6 trench star close SC closure device was used for groin closure for hemostasis. The patient was monitored in the ICU for 24 hours following the procedure. Her headaches resolved postoperatively. She was placed on a 5-day decadron taper and discharged home the following day with follow-up imaging completed at 6 months.